Uh, today I'd like to talk about Václav Havel and uh, a former Czech president. Uh, dates were 1936 to 2011. And uh, here's Havel on the left. So uh, for those that aren't completely familiar, Havel was a Czech poet, essayist, playwright, and dissident uh, before becoming president. And really was a, a giant at the end of the 20th century, uh, particularly when it came to uh, the dissolution of the USSR and the end of the Cold War. And we'll learn more of why he's held in such high esteem. Uh, Havel was born in Prague, Czechoslovakia. It's 1936. And uh, let's go down here uh, quickly and look at uh, Czechoslovakia at the time. Czechoslovakia became its own country in 1918 uh, at the end of World War I. So here you have uh, in red the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and uh, Czechoslovakia was uh, was part of this empire, uh, but uh, the empire dissolved at the end of World War One, and Czechoslovakia became its own country, and uh, remained uh, under its first republic until 1948, uh, when the communists took over, and uh, Havel came from a fairly uh, commercially and culturally influential family, and uh, considered upper middle class by uh, by any means. And sure enough, the, the communists uh, went out of their way to cut the Havel down, uh, the appropriated property and uh, assets. And uh, Václav, who was very interested in pursuing a career in liberal arts, was instead sent to the military in 1957. His reward for being part of the upper middle class was a uh, two-year stint as a minesweeper. Uh, fortunately, uh, he uh, survived this, uh, this role assigned to him by the communists. And when he came out uh, of the military, he was able to find a role in his uh, career of choice as a stagehand at ABC Theatre. Uh, humble beginnings. Uh, at night, uh, Havel would, uh, would study uh, theatre via correspondence, and uh, by 1963, he had written his first play, uh, The Garden Party. And uh, in 1964, he married his wife, who would be with him for over 30 years, and a, very, and a rock in his life. So that's Olga uh, on the right here. And uh, in 1965, he wrote uh, his second play, The Memo, and this play uh, gained him quite a bit of notoriety uh, within Europe, Eastern Europe, and uh, internationally. In the spirit of uh, also a Czech writer, Franz Kafka, who wrote uh, The Trial, uh, Havel's, uh, Havel's work, The Garden Party and The Memo, were, uh, were searing criticisms of the Czechoslovakian system or the totalitarian systems in general. But he did it uh, by just treating them as absurd. He, he just mocked the systems. He mocked their ideology and the bureaucracies. Uh, in 1968, the memo uh, was actually performed in New York, uh, great reviews. And uh, 68 was also the year of the Prague Spring, though. And uh, it's a very important event in uh, Havel's own career and uh, the Cold War and for the country itself. I'll spend a couple of moments on that. So the Prague Spring was a, a period of reform in 1968. Uh, led by uh, Czechoslovakian uh, communist leader Alexander Dubček. Uh, Dubček was uh, promoting something he called socialism with a human face. Uh, this is essentially a form of de-Stalinization, which had been going on in Soviet Union since 1953. It, uh, it, it was much later to come to Czechoslovakia. But it was, it was just a series of reforms that uh, allowed the country more freedoms such as the freedom of speech and the freedom of travel. But what happened was that uh, the Soviet leadership under uh, Leonid Brezhnev thought that uh, Dubček was taking these reforms too far. And uh, in response, uh, they sent uh, 2,000 uh, tanks and 200,000 troops from the Warsaw Pact, which was the military alliance set up by the Soviets, to essentially crush this movement. There would be no socialism with a human face. Uh, Dubček was uh, deposed, and uh, uh, Gustav uh, Husak replaced him, and basically rolled back all of his reforms. Now, this was a very big blow to uh, a lot of the uh, dissidents in Czechoslovakia at the time, including Havel. He hadn't uh, been as uh, outspoken as a dissident. He'd been using his plays, uh, the memo, and uh, the garden party as the vehicle to criticize the country. But uh, after Prague Spring, uh, he, his plays were banned from the country, and uh, he was uh, not allowed to leave Czechoslovakia. So uh, the Prague Spring was really 
a game changer when it came to the country and it kind of spurred Havel onto the next act of his, uh, his life. So essentially out of a day job, Havel became a brewer. He worked at a brewery and continued to write on the side. And uh, his work uh, was, was shuttled around the country, his censored work, via a method known as Sam is that. I'm pretty sure I butchered that. But uh, essentially, this is just documents that were censored being passed uh, person to person, hand by hand. And this ended up uh, spreading throughout uh, his country and, and to East, Eastern Europe and, uh, uh, and abroad. So he, he continued to be a dissident of, of, of quite a bit of influence. And we're going to fast forward a bit to 1976. So up here on the right, we have uh, Plastic People, the Universe. This was a rock band which was uh, imprisoned by the Czechoslovakian leadership uh, essentially because they were speaking out against the country, uh, uh, particularly the communist leadership. Uh, not unlike uh, the Pussy Riot, uh, how they were jailed uh, recently in Russia uh, for speaking out against Putin. Now, Havel thought this was uh, obviously ridiculous and together with 241 other signatories in 1976, he, he uh, he created a memo uh, which turned into a movement called Charter 77. This charter uh, basically requested the Czechoslovakian leadership to honor uh, its pledge to the Helsinki Accord of uh, 1975, uh, which, which allowed or guaranteed certain human rights, um, which obviously the leadership had, uh, had been not observing. So Charter 77 got many of the signatories, including Havel, into quite a bit of trouble because uh, this was a very uh, uh, overt... Uh, anti-government document. So uh, Havel and his, uh, uh, and his associates, they were, they were harassed, they were in prison, they spent some time in jail, they were followed around by the police. And uh, in 1978, uh, to kind of an addition to Charter 77, and it, they, they started a, another organization called the uh, Avons, which was uh, the Czech acronym for the Committee of the uh, Unjustly Prosecuted. And uh, Havel would eventually go to jail for his work with Vons in 1979. But before then, he wrote uh, The Power of the Powerless, an incredible essay in, in 1978, which kind of laid out the framework for his ideas on uh, how the totalitarian states were laying the, uh, the seeds of their own demise. Totalitarian. Yeah, there we go. So basically, the essay, it speaks on a lot of issues, but his, uh, the example he uses is quite famous is, imagine you were a green grocer, so basically somebody that sells fruit. So this is your store, and you sell fruit from your store, and every day you put a sign in your window, and the sign is this sign, Workers of the World Unite. And you might not actually want the workers of the world to unite, and you might not really care whether or not they do. But you put the sign there to show that you uh, are not against necessarily the communist leadership and that you support them. And this is a small act. And Havel basically says in totalitarian societies, these small acts, essentially living in a lie because whether or not you believe it, you do it anyways, it's, uh, it's self-censorship. And in totalitarian societies, uh, the leadership requires self-censorship because the resources to actually keep everybody in line is too difficult. But by putting this sign in his window, the green grocer is effectively just ob observing himself, is regulating himself. And this is a big W, a big victory for the totalitarian state. Uh, but Havel goes on is that this simple act can be reversed. And, and he writes at length about it, and I think it's worth quoting his uh, essay. So he writes that, One day something in our green grocer snaps, and he stops putting up the slogans merely to ingratiate himself. So he stops putting this slogan up. He stops voting in elections he knows are a farce. He begins to say what he thinks uh, at political meetings, and he even finds a strength in himself to express solidarity with those whom his conscience commands him to support. In this revolt, the green grocer steps out of living within the lie. He rejects the ritual and breaks the rules of the game. He discovers once more his suppressed identity and dignity. He gives his freedom a concrete significance. His revolt is an attempt to live within the truth. So very powerful essay. It inspired other movements in Eastern Europe, such as Solidarity in Poland. And uh, it's, it's just really kind of foresaw what was going to happen to the totalitarian system. Essentially, 
At this lower level, when people started deciding not to live in the lie, everybody did it, and the system collapsed. Now, Havel, uh, as I mentioned, went to prison in 1979. He did his longest stint, uh, over four years, until 82. During that time, he was not allowed to write uh, anything other than to his family, and he wrote uh, uh, very many letters to his wife, Olga. And these letters uh, kind of also laid out his, uh, his, his intent, his feelings about the system, and they became uh, one of his most important works. So we'll fast forward a bit to uh, 1989 here. And um, we can kind of uh, look at how this plays out in the 80s. At the, at the beginning of 1989, uh, Havel spent about uh, four months in prison in Czechoslovakia. And the communist leadership uh, of the country was basically just the tone deaf to what was happening around them. Uh, it, all over Eastern Europe, in Poland and uh, famously in East Germany when, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the tides were turning against communism. And in early November of 1989, so we're talking about the Velvet Revolution here, uh, the Berlin Wall fell. So this is uh, about the first week. And then uh, within the middle of the month, uh, demonstrators in Czechoslovakia uh, descended on uh, Wenceslas Square. In Prague, hundreds of thousands of them, and they, they, they basically were demanding that the communist leadership uh, uh, leave the country or uh, or give up their position of power. And the man that they wanted, obviously, to be uh, in the position of power was Havel. So Havel formed a, a group called the Civic Forum, and they basically this organization basically negotiated with uh, the communist government on how to hand over power. And the whole process was done extremely smoothly and with almost essentially zero bloodshed. Uh, no shots were fired. And this is how we, the movement or the revolution got the name the Velvet Revolution. It was extremely smooth. And as you can imagine, Velvet is very smooth, so it's a, quite an appropriate name. Um, so Havel, um, eventually, on the strength of the, the demonstrators, uh, the weakness of the Communist Party, and through the Civic Forum, became the president of Czechoslovakia at the end of December uh, 1989. The first democratic election was held a year later in 1990, or not a year later, in the spring of 1990, and Havel was elected president. Uh, now this was just a momentous moment. We, we need to flash back and talk about this entire system up here. This communist system was just peacefully, or not necessarily peacefully, it was essentially silently compared to armed conflict, just collapsing. And it was people like Havel who had the fortitude, the perseverance, uh, the intelligence, and just the, the courage He just to speak out against the system. Uh, I get chills just talking about it sometimes. And he, uh, he basically, uh, the way uh, Christopher Hitchens put it, is he just folded his arms and he laughed at the system until it collapsed. And that's what he did with his writing. Now, uh, becoming president uh, wasn't all peaches and cream. Uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, the, the way the constitution was set up was that the president actually was more of a figurehead. Uh, he didn't have very many executive powers. But uh, Havel was, uh, was an extremely influential. He had more authority. And uh, now that he was uh, uh, in the castle, which is uh, where the president lives, uh, in, Czechoslo in Czechoslovakia, or now the Czech Republic, uh, he still had a lot of sway. And in his time, he oversaw the split of Czechoslovakia into the, the Czech Republic and Slovakia. He actually resigned his position uh, to, to say that basically that he didn't want the country to split, but it was a very, fairly uh, a peaceful split. Uh, it was called the Velvet Divorce because of how peaceful it was. And... Uh, uh, Havel played a, a large part in pushing uh, uh, Czechoslovakia and then obviously the Czech Republic, uh, which it was from 1993 following the, the Velvet Divorce, uh, uh, towards the West. Uh, they joined uh, NATO in 1999 and, uh, and the e e European Union in 2003, or 2004, sorry. He, he finished his presidency in 2003. So, just a couple of brief notes. Uh, Olga passed in 1996, and uh, controversially, uh, Havel remarried a year later uh, in 1997. Uh, but that was a personal issue, and I don't know why people get so caught up on that. And um, 
uh, when Havel passed in 2011, there's obviously uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, paid their respects. And uh, just looking back at this man's life, it was truly an incredible life. And we look back here at the, the Velvet Revolution and just uh, just to know that words can change the world. And uh, Havel is, uh, is an testament to that.